All right, in this chapter, we're going to be talking about business entities and the different types that we can use to form our business, how they're organized, how we go about forming each one, and then what are the consequences um, in terms of how they have to be organized from a managerial perspective, and then what are the tax consequences to the business owners and the business entity itself, which is sometimes treated like its own separate legal entity. Um, and then what are the other consequences to the owners and the business for other liabilities that the business might incur? Say, you know, the business, um, so somebody is injured because of something that the business itself does or one of its employees does. So we're going to start now by talking about the first two types, the most informal of the business entities. But first, uh, you know, each business structure is governed um, by its own set of laws in each state, and they all establish their own um, procedures for how you go about forming them. Most importantly, usually that's done through the Secretary of State's office for the state that you're incorporating in, and um, they tell you how to go about doing that, and then also how each business structure has to. Um, operate. So for the specifics of, of the business entity you're looking at, you want to make sure to be familiar with your state's laws uh, depending on where you um, incorporate. All right, the first type of business you can form is a sole proprietorship. This is the easiest, simplest one to form because it's just one person has to be involved and that's why it's called a sole proprietorship. There's just one proprietor and all you have to do to, to go about forming this, you don't have to file any paperwork with your state. You don't have to do anything other than just start doing business by yourself. Um, and that's what a sole proprietorship is. You just go out there and you start doing business. You start uh, selling hot dogs in the street corner. You open up a t-shirt store, whatever. Just start doing business by yourself. That's a sole proprietorship if you don't do anything else. Now, because this is all you have to do to start one, um, the business itself is treated as completely, it's not, com it's not treated as separate from the owner. So this is why it's not really a good idea to do business this way, unless maybe you, you have a very, very small um, you know, business opportunity. It might not be that, that big of a deal if you are just going to sell some snow cones for one day out of the year or something for a couple of hours and maybe it's not that big of a deal but um, generally you want your business to be treated as a separate entity so that you have some of the protections that come with that, that we'll discuss a little bit later um, so if somebody brings a lawsuit against you then at, at, for, or against your business or, or based on the business that's done this lawsuit is going to be brought against just you and you'll be named in the lawsuit and there won't be a separate corporate entity to make the defendant and then also for tax purposes the IRS is going to expect just a tax return from you and they're just going to treat taxes um, they're going to take treat the business's taxes as no different and not separate from your own personal tax return so as you can see with the sole proprietorship there's really not any uh, the reason you don't have to do anything is because there's not any particular legal advantage to doing business that way the second type uh, and also a type that does not require any formal paperwork is called a partnership. Now a partnership, to to be considered a partnership, uh, you, you don't have to file any paperwork, you just have to simply start doing business as a partnership. And so it's important to understand the definition of, of what that entails. And it's, you see at the top there, a partnership is an association of two or more, more persons. Obviously, we have to have at least two people, otherwise we don't have uh, partners. And it's to carry on a business as co-owners for a profit. Now, those two last parts are important because the last part, these do not apply to nonprofits. So, if it's a nonprofit endeavor, there's a separate uh, way to go about incorporating a nonprofit. And we won't talk about that here, um, but it's a it's a completely separate thing. It does not apply to the rules that we're going to talk about with a partnership. So, th these are two or more people who are going to carry on a business together um, to turn a profit, and then carry it out as co-owners, which and that's what makes them partners. It's very important that they behave as co-owners and not like something else, like a 
an investor and an owner, like a sole proprietor with a, an investing partner. That's different because an investor can be passive and not necessarily act as, a, as an owner or a co-owner. And so anybody involved in the partnership, whether it's two people, three people, or 16 people, they all have to behave as co-owners, and co-owners have the same rights as each other to um, impact the dealings of the business and the way the business is run, just like anybody who owns any piece of property has the right to control it. So they share uh, control over the day-to-day -day operations. Um, just as a side note, that partner can also be another business entity itself. They don't have to be individual partners. A partnership could be formed with a corporation and another corporation, or an LLC and a corporation, or an LLC and an individual person. Um, these are treated as separate legal entities so that in the lawsuit, the partnership itself would be named as a whole, but they are treated basically the same as a sole proprietorship in terms of liabilities, tax liabilities and, and other liabilities. They go directly to the partnership, or to, I mean, to the partners themselves. So when you file your tax returns as a partnership, each partner is filing the profit and loss statement is going incorporated into their individual income tax return. And then if the partnership is sued, the partners uh, themselves are liable. Um, they're directly liable for whatever losses incur. So there's not the shield of a separate business uh, to in whatever assets it has to um, shield the partner's assets from liability. So whatever the partners own at the time of the lawsuit could be subject to these liabilities. And that, as you can see, is, I mean, the advantage here, it's, it's, it doesn't take anything to, um, any paperwork to start it, and it allows you the advantage of doing business as co-owners with other people, so you share some of that responsibility, but you're still directly liable on for taxes on one tax return and then um, directly liable for any damages incurred from the business you're doing. Now again, to form one, you just start doing a business. That's all it takes. It doesn't have to be anything filed, um, although it's a good idea and you probably want to come up with a partnership agreement that spells out what your understanding is as co-owners. But if you don't, every state has a uniform uh, partnership code that uh, will tell you the rules for how the partners, what their what the relationship is going to be, absent any sort of uh, negotiated agreement to the contrary. And the rules essentially in, in the statute make it so that uh, they share responsibilities and liabilities um, in proportion to their ownership, the partnership. So it's usually going to be based on if there's three of them, then they're going to share everything one third, profit and loss. Um, you know, if, they, if there's eight of them, then they're each going to have a one eighth share in the responsibility, the profits, and any losses that, that it incurs. Um, so here's a little bit, just some points to keep in mind on the slide here about uh, put what you might put into a written agreement. If you're going, you know, some of the things that you might want to cover. First, I want to go back to this definition of partnership and why it's important to know whether you're doing business as partners versus something else. So this case is called uh, Zoo versus Bickley. What happened here is there's a guy named Bickley who was working at a motorcycle shop and there was a Chinese store, a Chinese restaurant next door where he ate lunch frequently. And the guy who owned the shop was getting ready to retire. And so Bickley had worked there for a while. He knew the, he knew the business. And so he was kind of interested in, um, purchasing this from the guy he worked for when he got time when it got time to sell it and he had been having these conversations with the couple that ran the Chinese restaurant and so they decide they you know they tell him eventually we want to go into you know we'd like to help you start this business and so they suggest that they help him you know get this thing started so all three of them signed a two-year lease together um, for the building the the motorcycle shop uh, the couple paid the security deposit and the first month's rent for him. They, they paid for the inventory to get the shop ready. Um, they gave him some more money for various things when he asked for it. And eventually, um, after 
this arrangement for a while of giving him money to pay for things. They asked for keys to the building, and then they wanted to see uh, the receipts and invoices, the profit and losses, and he refused these things, um, treating them not as if they were owners, and they expected to be treated like owners, but they had never really clearly agreed to do that. They had only agreed to uh, to be co-signers on a lease and to give him money for various things to fund, to finance the this endeavor. So once they realize that he's not agreeing to these things, they demand a written agreement, and he refuses, and that's where we get this lawsuit ultimately. And the couple that owned the Chinese restaurant, they lose the case because what they're asking for is they're asking to be treated as co-owners and they want the court to say, you know, you owe them all these things they're asking for because they're, they together own two thirds of the motorcycle shop. But the problem was they don't have any, they didn't form any, they didn't, uh, form any formal business entity. There was no paperwork filed with the state to form a business. So now we've got two options so far for things that aren't uh, for informal business arrangements. We talked about a sole proprietorship. That wouldn't apply um, to the three of them. So then we're left with, did they form a partnership? And the only way they can do that, they can do that without filing anything formal, but the only way they can do that is to actually be behaving as co-owners to carry on a business for profit. This is a profit-based business. But the question is, were they actually carrying on as co-owners? And the court found that they weren't because um, they weren't given any access that an owner would have. They had gotten a lease on the building. They paid for the deposit. They had paid for the rent. They signed the lease. Um, but it wasn't until much later that they started asking to, to have the things that an owner would have at the outset, like the keys and be, having, be getting um, able to review the the receipts and invoices and the expenses and, and whatever profit and loss there was and uh, to be able to, they wanted also to come work at the shop and he refused that. So they weren't really um, ever given any of the um, the privileges of it, that an owner would have and thus without any indication that they formed another type of business entity that would require formal paperwork with the state, uh, it was just a question of whether or not they were actually behaving as partners and because they weren't, they are kind of out of luck on that front and they're they're left to sort of they're left basically as unsecured lenders because they didn't seem like they got any collateral on on the money that they were giving them so they they may still be entitled to um collect some of their money uh over time as a lender on that basis but they're not considered uh, a partnership and there's just the rest of the slide. I'll let you pause that if you want to look at that more. All right. Now, important with partners, they owe one, they owe something called fiduciary duties to one another. And this is, as Justice Cardozo put it, it's an honest, not just honesty alone, but the punctilio of an honor most sensitive. And what that means is it's not just the fact, you know how people sometimes will get away with something, they'll They'll sort of deceive you, but they didn't lie to you uh, directly, but they kind of let you, they let you operate under a false pretense to your detriment. And then they try to excuse it because they didn't affirmatively try to deceive you. And they have a sort of like, you know, buyers be, beware attitude, like it was, it was on you. Well, that doesn't work with partners or with people that you're in a position of trust with, like a trustee also has these sort of duties to a, to a beneficiary. It's not just enough that you are honest, but you have to be forthright and make sure that you tell them things that it's sort of just like the golden rule. How would you want to be treated? Um, if it's something that they're not obligated to tell you, but it would be in your best interest, then they need to they need to make sure that they keep you aware of the things uh, that are in your best interest as a partner and as an owner of this um, enterprise. So um, obviously this means, you know, if it just means complete trust and loyalty and complete disclosure of any financial or uh, business decisions that might be um, in your interest to know them and especially not to put your interest as an individual partner above anybody else in the partnership. It has to, you have to act in a way that puts the whole of the partnership 
ahead of your uh, individual interest. Um, just another note there, in terms of, um, I told you the rules will, unless you come to some other arrangement with a formal written agreement, the rules treat, the rules in each uh, Uniform Partnership Act are going to treat the partners as equals, basically, so equal division of duties and, and responsibility and benefit. Um, and then it has some other rules that tell us how we, um, how the partners govern themselves. In terms of their decisions that are made, most of the decisions are going to be turn on a majority vote of the partners, uh, just like any board would. Um, a majority vote will carry the day. And there are, there will be some unanimous, uh, some decisions requiring unanimous consent that are very serious such as selling the business or adding a new partner or otherwise substantially changing uh, what the business does. And you want to make sure to look at your state's Uniform Par Partnership Act to make sure you understand what those are. And of course, you can change some of these again if you come up with a written agreement and you want to have two-thirds vote on certain issues um, and unanimous votes on some things that are not mentioned or mandated by the code. You can do those as well. But for the basic everyday decisions, you're looking at a majority vote, you can expect. Now, this is important. When the partnership is dissolved, you have to remember that it is not complete until you have what's called a winding up. Now, a dissolution occurs whenever there's a change in the structure of the partnership. So whenever one partner leaves, um, or you just decide altogether to close down the partnership, or you add a new partner um, when after one leaves, uh, once that happens, you have that is considered a dissolution, but the process isn't complete until you have a complete winding up of all the partnership's affairs, which means a complete accounting of, like for instance, if, the part, if a partner is leaving, a complete accounting of what he is owed, um, due diligence on any outstanding liabilities, like is there a lawsuit currently going on that we don't know how much it's going to, we don't know how much it's going to cost because it hasn't settled yet or hasn't gone to trial, or even if there is not a lawsuit yet, but you know something just, one of the partner, partners was just accused of um, sexual assault. And we know that there's, we have reason to believe there's a serious lawsuit coming. Well, you have to, you have to find some way to sort of wrap that up for the other partner and, and decide what his, uh, how that affects his ultimate uh, profit and loss upon exiting the partnership. But again, just make sure you remember that any dissolution is not complete until you have a, a complete winding up of the affairs of the partnership. Okay, we'll finish with this since, since we're talking about partnerships. A limited partnership is the first, form, first business entity that we'll talk about that does require formal filing with the state. Now, a limited partnership works like a partnership with one key difference. It's basically the same as what we talked about before, but there's one key difference, two key differences really. One, again, is that there is a formal registration process, so you can't form one unless you go through the paperwork with your state uh, secretary of state. But the other difference in terms of the owners is that you have partners, but you have to have at least two types of partners here. Before, we just have one type of partner, and that's a general partner. And here, though, you have to have at least one, you still have to have at least two people to carry on a business together for as co-owners for profit. Um, but the difference is that at least one, one of each of those has to be one of two types of partners. A general partner is what we were talking about before. The other type is a limited partner. And a limited partner is somebody who shares in the ownership of the business such that they can collect uh, the profits from the business. But their liability, unlike a regular partnership where the liability goes straight to the individual partners, a limited partner is shielded from those liabilities. So they become basically like a passive investor, like a uh, almost like a, a stockholder. If you buy some stock on the stock exchange and that business goes out, you're only limited to you don't have to pay any of the lawsuits that they get themselves into. Your only risk is whatever you've invested in the company. So what this does is it encourages people 
to invest in a partnership that maybe don't really, maybe they have the money to invest and they believe in the other partners, but they don't really have the, um, the skill to run the partnership. And so they can get the shield of liability while taking the risk with their own money. But because of that, because of that shield of liability, to be a limited partner, you have to refrain from management of the business. So you can't be going in there every day and, you know, bossing the employees around and making decisions about how the day-to-day -day business runs. So in that sense, you're, you're not quite acting the way maybe a normal owner would be because you have to refrain from the day-to-day -day management. And if you don't do that, and it turns out, even if you have a limited partnership certificate, a court can, can sort of rewrite it if it finds out in a lawsuit, if it comes out that there's a lot of evidence that the limited partners were we're not behaving that way and we're acting like managers, then they can strip you of that and then you may you may be personally liable for liabilities the way that other the way that other partners are. And so again, you'll file this paperwork. Here's what you would have on most of them. Importantly, of course, you have to name and uh, specify who those limited partners are versus who the general partners are. And like with other business entities, you need to designate when you do business that it is a limited partnership. And so you can do that usually by just LP so that you don't have to write out limited partnership. Um, and I think some, I think maybe LTD for limited might suffice. Um, but you want to make sure that you put that out there so that people know who they're dealing with uh, and they know what kind of business they're dealing with in, in particular when they know that, they can research that paperwork with the Secretary of State's office, and they're on notice as to who the limited partners are. So if there's a really, really wealthy partner who's, just, who's the only LP, people will know that they're not going to be able to get his money if something goes wrong and they need to sue you. He's limited. Uh, his liability is, is limited. And so the other partners you're dealing with, they may not have, they may have the skill in the business, like maybe it's a restaurant and you have a limited partner and a couple of chefs who are the general partners. You might have a lot of faith in their abilities, and that's why the limited partner is investing. But if you're doing business with them, they may not have any money, and it may be important for you to know that the, the, the partner with all the money is actually shielding himself from liability in this investment. This case is mostly just a reminder that um, another business entity, again, just like with a partnership, can can be one of the partners. So a corporation could be the limited partner if it wanted to, and so on. Uh, the dissolution and winding up thing here is still is basically the same rules as we talked about for a general partnership. All right, before we get into corporations, I'm going to stop there and I'll leave that for the next video on corporations and LLCs.